hello and honored to be invited to participate in this conference uh, by Jacob Parkinson and, and uh, his team at Embodied Philosophy. I love the whole idea of Embodied Philosophy and I think I'll be speaking uh, on something that uh, you know, gives a certain Indic angle, a traditional uh, Indian and Tibetan angle on what that might mean in, in real life terms. Um, I think I'm going to speak to you a little bit today about the uh, what you know the uh, scholars call the tantric traditions of India and Tibet. It's a specific kind of uh, contemplative practice that really works a lot with the body, with the nervous system, with sort of the subtler layers of consciousness than we uh, normally associate with meditation, uh, or rather deeper layers of consciousness. Um, and really, first, I'm going to sort of set a little bit of a context in terms of where we are in the Western assimilation of Indian Buddhism and sort of where, you know, how the Indians and Tibetans and other Asians view the unfolding of uh, contemplative science, contemplative practice, uh, you know, to just sort of contextualize how, you know, uh, where, we are, where we are in terms of this intersection or meeting. So, uh, you know, I think we've, the West has sort of run into Buddhism through various kind of global uh, interactions with India and Asia. <clears throat> the oldest being the British colonization of India, where we started finding out about uh, the Theravada traditions in Sri Lanka and Burma and so on. Um, and so that's, you know, the Polytech Society and other early interpreters and translators of that tradition began our first acquaintance with, with Buddhism, and in a sense we, we've come to think of that as classical Buddhism um, for various reasons, but that's one of them, that we met at the first. Um, and sort of in the post-war era, we had another contact with East Asia through our, uh, you know, the Second World War and our, inter our subsequent interactions with Japan, where we started to sort of uh, get exposed to Zen Buddhism and the other East Asian forms of Buddhism um, and really sort of sort of to have a cultural dialogue when some uh, Japanese Zen masters came to the West um, and started uh, you know, teaching American students and developing their own lineage and tradition. Um, so it wasn't, however, until the, until the late, until 1959 or really the early 60s when the Tibetans who were the kind of holders of the uh, most elaborated tantric forms or uh, esoteric forms of Buddhist practice um, got pushed onto the scene by the Chinese invasion of Tibet. And that refugee community that settled in India with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and other sort of senior teachers and leaders of the Tibetan community really sort of brought Western awareness to a uh, a flavor of Buddhism that you know we've we're, that we were the last to come upon, um, and that's still really the least known and the least understood um, in terms of our Western stereotypes or integration or assimilation of Buddhist uh, culture. So, so if we we really you know, I often think about these sort of uh, global. Uh, transfers of contemplative wisdom practice as kind of like waves of culture. And so uh, I will sometimes talk about the Theravada tradition and the, and the coming of mindfulness, and now we have a mindfulness revolution. It's kind of the first wave. Um, and it's amazing how, what a great impact it's having. And it's sort of integrated to some extent with the coming of the Hatha Yoga tradition from the Hindu side of Indian culture. Both Hatha Yoga and mindfulness practice are really about um, calming, stopping, bringing a sense of awareness, presence, peace, nonviolence to our lives. And that is one of the things that we need in order to be radically present, is to be able to start uh, really reconnecting with ourselves so that we can really be present to ourselves and then really perhaps be able to bring that into our lives. Um, you know, the second wave I think is just beginning to come up, come around. We're just beginning to find, both through uh, our understanding of, uh, you know, for example, our, our good friend Sharon Salzberg started to write about loving kindness, and we 
you know, sometimes refer to her as the goddess of love and kindness in the West, and she certainly really brought that to the fore. And then, in the meanwhile, there have been uh, more, as the Tibetans have, have come onto the scene, His Holiness and others talking more about compassion, uh, they've sparked, uh, you know, more and more interest uh, in this, what we consider, what I consider the second wave. And the second wave uh, in the language of the Indian Buddhist traditions is called the Mahayana, uh, the greater vehicle, or the uh, my, my uh, mentor and friend Bob Thurman likes to call it the universal vehicle. It's like the big bus that's there for everybody to ride on. The Theravada really is more focused very specifically on putting your own oxygen mask on, taking care of yourself, stopping the violence in your own mind and body so you can you know, show up for yourself. Whereas the Mahayana then becomes, in a sense, the next step. And it's, it's sort of an extension of the loving-kindness tradition that grows out of mindfulness practice. So loving-kindness is like a bridge between those two waves or whatever. It's a, a merging of those two waves. Um, and, and, but the what's unique about the Mahayana or universal approach is that it's an attempt to uh, really uh, elaborate and expand on uh, loving kindness, compassion, emotional training practices, essentially as a way to, as, to sort of bring mindfulness into the everyday world, to bring it, to take it on the road, as it were. You know, you're sitting on the cushion, you're, you're, you're being very mindful, but then you go out and, you know, you, have, you sort of get you know, annoyed at the, cab, the, the taxi driver or you, you have a, a stressful day at work and you're sort of lost. So, you know, uh, of course, part of the solution to that is to keep going back to uh, basic training in being present, stopping the reactivity. Um, but another piece of it is to learn to protect our emotional minds from all of the stress emotions that normally get stirred up in our complicated interactions with the world. So, uh, as I like to say, if you're going to be a if, if you're going to be a, a a monastic or or retreat oriented a hermit practitioner of mindfulness, um, that may be a perfect and sufficient practice to you. But if you're going to be a lay person in the world and be dealing with, you know, the complicated uh, uh, social emotional demands of uh, everyday life and a lot of people who aren't practicing mindfulness who might be sort of practicing get out of my way or give me more of that <clears throat> then I think you know we need to have we need to insulate our minds uh, and our uh, reactive emotions from the stresses and strains of those interactions and learn how to bring uh, kindness acceptance tolerance with others who are in a negative state of mind so we don't get sort of contaminated or triggered uh, into our own negativity so that's kind of the second wave of practice as we're becoming familiar with it. And then, you know, what I'm talking about in the Tantras, I consider to be a third wave. Um, and so uh, what could that possibly be? Well, um, let me sort of back up and provide a little more context, both in terms of the Indic traditions and how they view these three different forms of contemplative life. And on the other side, some of the science that's coming out in the the applications, the research in terms of neuro, uh, neuroscience impacts, uh, benefits of these practices and how they're being integrated into things like psychotherapy or, or uh, coaching or uh, you know, uh, everyday life in different ways. So um, let me begin by talking a little bit about India since we've been talking about the West. Um, you know, of course, these these uh, traditions, you know, both on the Hindu and the Buddhist side, uh, the yoga tradition, the mindfulness tradition, the Buddhist uh, Mahayana practice, and so on, really grew out of, uh, you know, a very unique culture. I, I often like to think of India as, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the mango grove of Eurasia in the sense that it uh, was uniquely, not only was a very temperate, but it had a unique fertile uh, land uh, with sort of hundreds of times more arable uh, land with its Ganges and Indus river valleys than the other major centers of river valley civilization in the ancient world. So it was a very rich and abundant place. You know, uh, we had in the West, we had Athens and Sparta and Corinth and whatever, maybe a handful of those. In India, they had 14 city-states at around the same, around the same time. 
Alexander conquered every, everywhere from Greece through, through Persia, but he couldn't conquer India. He got stopped by uh, Chandragupta Maurya uh, and their elephant armies. Um, and uh, you know, some say that's how he died, uh, from a lance uh, in that conflict. So India was not only uh, more abundant uh, economically, more secure militarily, it was, it was extremely geopolitically secure, right? Because it's got the Himalayas on the top, it's got two oceans on each side, and there's only one way you could get into India through the Hindu Kush. And so that is you know, through what present-day Afghanistan. So you're either going to come, you know, try to conquer them through there, or basically India is a very defensible area. And if you compare that to the Mediterranean, where you can attack anywhere from, you know, anything from anywhere, right? And everybody's speaking, you know, 75 different languages. Or China, where, you know, constantly the Chinese were, that's why they built the Great Wall. They were constantly getting invaded from the Eurasian uh, nomads, uh, the Central Asian nomads, who, who would sort of, whenever things got cold or, or scarce up in the steppes, would just sort of run, run down. And the Tibetans were amongst those people early on, and so were the Mongolians. Um, so uh, India was the most defensible and probably the wealthiest and powerful of the ancient civilizations. And so and whether it's that or the climate or for whatever reason, India early on decided that uh, it wasn't just a good thing for a few uh, specialists like shamans or ministers or priests or, you know, whatever, rishi sages to learn how to control their minds and how to achieve unusual states of well-being or transcendence or whatever, they believed that it was, you know, not only, you know, kind of a necessity for everybody in the society to learn these skills so that everybody could sort of calm down, be more productive, get along with each other, do the things that civilized people need to do, but also they believed it was everybody's right, every person's individual birthright. And this was an idea that was especially, uh, you know, popular or sort of key in the, in the Buddhist revolution, the social revolution of Buddhism, was that it didn't matter what caste or what gender you came from, uh, you had a right to leave whatever social life you were in and pursue your own personal enlightenment. But that was just representative of a larger Upanishadic Indian movement where this notion that everybody could be enlightened or spiritually realized or have find great inner peace or whatever, however you want to look at that. Uh, become contemplative in some way. And so out of that, India really dedicated this cultural, intellectual, and, and financial resources to, uh, to developing these techniques or systems whereby ordinary people could learn in, through training periods and through periods of intense kind of re-education how to be more peaceful, how to be more content, how to be more present, how to be more uh, positively engaged with the world. Uh, and so one version of that is the Buddhist Academy and the Theravada tradition. Another version is the Hindu yoga system. Um, and, uh, you know, both of those grew up together in dialogue and grew up in dialogue not only with each other, but also with an evolving civilization, right? So phase one, take one, there's the, you know, India discovers individual liberation and the importance of personal freedom and a ra radical peace of mind, everybody's birthright, and, and in a sense events the science of spirituality or contemplative science as a, as a, as a, a science and technology that is key to a living and nonviolent civilization, a happy, healthy life in a nonviolent civilization. Then pretty much that slowly chills India out, and India starts to become less militaristic, less violent. Uh, people start to become more focused on spiritual, cultural, contemplative aims and, and methods. And you get a, a shift in the center of gravity from the monastery or, or the, the retreat in the woods where the Buddhism and Hinduism or uh, Vedism were uh, initially kind of practiced toward the, the city and where people were sort of pouring into the cities, and like our cities, and like the uh, cities in Greece and so on, uh, looking for ways of becoming, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, more comfortable, 
living, dealing with all different kinds of people without necessarily a single social order, um, and also wanted, you know, to get some of those contemplative uh, methods and some of the peace and presence of mind without having to drop out, right? So the, as the society became uh, less violent, it became easier to stay in it and think about having a peaceful life in the society. So the center of gravity shifted toward these practices that are really more geared to life in the lay world. That is an everyday life like the life that we lead. But, you know, we think of uh, uh, you know, uh, living a contemplative life every day, today in the world. You know, certainly mindfulness is key, but what the new tools that began to be valued and, and, and uh, identified in that second wave were the Mahayana tools uh, on the uh, on the Buddhist side, and those are really kind of a radical openness, a radical open-mindedness that's often thought of as non-dual wisdom, a sense that we're all interconnected, that we should be open to uh, the infinity of, of different points of view and different ways of being and uh, our infinite interconnectedness with all things. And then the, the emotional side of that, which is the, the heartfelt openness or connectivity, that allows us to actually connect with more and more people and be more and more uh, distributed or socially engaged or you know more uh, sort of attuned to what others were thinking and what the world around us was like. So those two skills, that kind of radical open-mindedness and radical warm-heartedness or open-heartedness, uh, came to be the engines of the second wave. Right, and so they're reflected in the Mahayana traditions of, you know, uh, the wisdom of emptiness, the, the ultimate wisdom, uh, non-dual wisdom, and in the compassion practice of, you know, the Mahayana altruist, the bodhisattva, the person who's going to not drop out of society, not go to become a monk or a nun and quickly attain his own personal or her own personal freedom and liberation, but to actually stay engaged and not be able to bear leaving everybody stuck in society and society functioning in such a crazy way. So rather, that person gains, develops the, the commitment or the, 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 uh, the aspiration to be able to develop as a spiritual being in the world. And we do that by developing a greater level of wisdom so we can understand more and more people and their kinds of suffering, more and more our reactions to other people's suffering, and a greater compassion so that we can pretty much uh, feel non nonviolently. We can have we can care about others rather than getting frustrated or you know pissed off or frightened or when reactive to them. So that those are the skills of the second wave and, and that's reflected also in the Hindu tradition where we have Advaita uh, Hinduism, the the non-dual profound wisdom traditions which are really the Hindu version of, or, or a kind of cognate with, or analogs to the, the uh, Buddhist profound wisdom teachings of emptiness. And then on the compassion side, you have the bhakti traditions that are reflected in the uh, Bhagavad Gita and other great uh, classical Hindu uh, art and, and traditions. So essentially, I, the way I see the second wave is that the the center of gravity of contemplative science and civilization and you shifted from the monastery into the village, into the middle of the city, okay? And, the, and with that, the, the emphasis on what forms of Buddhism were funded and sort of what was the cutting edge of Buddhism shifted from the Theravada tradition, which is more really monastic in a sense, more based on mindfulness, stopping the violence, disengaging from the crazy world, and the Mahayana traditions, which, like the loving-kindness tradition uh, in Theravada, is more concerned about uh, being a contemplative person in the world, engaged with others, making a difference, making it a better place.